Good evening, sir. Yo, yo, this is episode 70 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast with your host, Brett and CH. Today's topics, two very important topics. Bitcoin back above 10K happened last night. We're going to talk a little bit about the sentiment, what's going on, how the market feels, a little bit of that. Then also your favorite topic, the coronavirus and, uh, you know, the, the big global macro event, you know, what's changed since the last time we talked about it? What does it mean for, you know, specifically you and I were talking about global supply chain stuff, um, how that can change the outlook. And even Raul Paul was talking about it too. I'd watched one of his things on Real Vision where he's like, well, this is an interesting kind of macro event. And he specifically mentioned Bitcoin when he was talking about it, going over his, you know, positions into into this. But um, yeah, interesting times for sure, man. But how's, how's it been going this week? It's, it's been going good. Uh, the coronavirus thing, it is it is our black swan. Uh, we, It's been like, I think now for the past three weeks, it's been my life just kind of just searching for the depths of the interwebs and Twitter, trying to find out as much as possible. Uh, it's It's been quite mind-blowing. And, you know, first we're going to cover Bitcoin here because I feel like it's going to be a rabbit hole and I can talk about the coronavirus for a while. Bitcoin has, since the beginning, of, really since uh, December 30th or whatever, it bounced at that, you know, 6,700. So I wonder, you know, in a correlation, did the market know about this? You know, in the market sense, the market knows. You know, because that's when the the first real, I didn't hear about it then, but that was when that um, doctor first reported it and was talking about it. And it, it, it popped up on the WHO, which is the world, um, I can't even think of it, World Health Organization. World uh, Health Organization. Yeah, yeah. I, I was like, that, that sounds too easy. World Health Organization, that's when it popped up on the radar. These doctors were like, yo, there's this viral pneumonia going around. And so Bitcoin has rallied a good, like, I don't know, 35% since. Uh, basically yep. January 1st, something like that. Yeah, roughly 35, 38%, which is pretty nice. So we're seeing, again, Bitcoin act as a, I guess you could say, safe haven asset, um, you know, akin to gold or silver. Gold and silver have, I don't know if they uh, And I think last night we were kind of shooting back and forth when it was, Bitcoin was at like $99, $150, dollars and it finally burst through last night. So... It's, it's yeah, still I mean, holding, so yeah, it's holding right around ten thousand eighty ish, ten thousand one hundred. Um, of course, it's nice to see, right? I think ten thousand is that big psychological barrier. Um, people get excited about it, and nobody cares until the price goes up, right? That, that's what we say all the time. You know, we'll beat that drum to the end of the day. Just price drives adoption. Nobody cares unless number go up. And even you had mentioned you got an email from Investopedia, you know, how to how to buy Bitcoin. What a, what a coincidence that they would send that today of all days when Bitcoin's back above 10K. Um, it's, you know, and I, I took a quick look at that email that you sent me and I went through. I, I was curious to see what, what they had in there. It was actually pretty lengthy. They did a half decent job. And of course, they, you know, they had pictures of Coinbase and using that and they they gave their pros and cons for using kind of each one. They mentioned Square, um, GDAX, Coinbase on the app, and Binance if you wanted to, you know, for more expert type of person. Um, so it was interesting to put what they had in there. But they also mentioned the halving and other stuff. But I was actually pretty surprised of uh, how detailed it was. But I don't know. When I'm sitting back and thinking about this, uh, just as you mentioned, is Bitcoin acting like a safe haven asset? And I think on one hand it is, but only for the people who look to it as a safe haven asset. So I I might look to it differently than, uh, you know, say someone else like Raul Powell is looking at it. And he's now, now he's, you know, gone enough down the Bitcoin rabbit hole where he might look to it as um, – as more defensive in, in his perspective, whereas other his other peers might just think that's full, you know, risk on, highly speculative. Um, he's not interested in that as playing defense, right, as opposed to gold. Um, but it, it's interesting to see it move kind of in tandem with these global macro type events. Like the last time there were rate cuts, it, it moved. And coronavirus, what a coincidence, it, it's, it's moving. Um, and the other thing that's interesting with Bitcoin specifically, when we talk about coronavirus, I feel like a lot of big updates in the news happen over the weekend. 
what else are you going to, there's nothing else to trade, but Bitcoin, if you need, um, instant protection over the weekend, there's nothing you can do until markets open on Monday morning and everything's going to gap one way or another come <laughs> Monday. So like, it, you know, it, it's just interesting, even if you're not overall curious about Bitcoin, it's the only thing that you can make a play on over the weekend when big news happens. And it, it is just fascinating that that is the case. Yeah, 24-7, 365. And it wasn't too long ago, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Raleigh Paul, if it was a tweet or something, a statement basically said, if you could own one asset for the next decade, and his statement was Bitcoin. Right. Yeah. He had like, I forget what he had on there, gold, Bitcoin or whatever else. And if you could only hold one thing and you have to hold it for 10 years, he would pick Bitcoin. I, you know, whether he's saying that just to drum up engagement or whatever, you know, I have no idea. But it's interesting that someone like Raul would even make such a statement because he, in hindsight, he could look very foolish. He's staking his reputation on that. And, uh, you know, he has a pretty good reputation in the global macro world from from the uh the hedge fund space i mean he's he's no slouch he knows what he's talking about for so for someone like that to make that kind of a comment i think is very interesting oh 100 percent. that's a it's just one of those things where you, you want you know he's you know one of those guys in the forefront i feel like there's some people still in that macro space who you know blow off bitcoin as just some random internet funny money and i think I think it's stupid if you're a macro or a large investor to blow it off at this point just because the gains you get in Bitcoin are nowhere. You don't get it anywhere else unless you're levered up a lot or you're buying like, you know, stocks that are small market caps. I mean, really, it's you don't really get gains like that anywhere else or have that ability to buy something like a spot Bitcoin. And, you know, like people who bought spot Bitcoin at the start of 2017 you know, 20x their money by the end of 2017. So it's, and granted, not everyone obviously sold the top, but you could have even sold at any point in December or January of 2017, 2018, and still would have been up 15 times, which is incredible, you know. And obviously that year was whack, and it, it definitely skewed me in terms of what's, you know, real gains in terms of like, oh, you know, my bag just 50 x and now when you ever you double anything from now on, it's not fun anymore. If you make 50% on something, it's not cool. And it took me a while to kind of normal. <laughs> it took me a while to kind of normalize back to not everything needs to like 10 x, you know, just be satisfied, satisfied with this little gain here. Um, but, you know, I, I would say definitely I got I got ruined by, you know, watching alt bags just blow up out of any proportion. I think a lot of people can say the same. It's like, Oh, this is only up two hundred percent. That's not cool. So, yeah, yeah. The uh, the Bitcoin space can definitely uh, wreck you and make you numb to small percentage moves in, <laughs> Very in any other in any other market. And uh, it's still a time of really high volatility, right? And even though technically, if you were to go and measure the volatility in Bitcoin over the last eleven years, it is going down. But it's still hard to live with the big drawdowns, the big pumps and, you know, running out of time to buy I, all the DMS that I got in the last two days were, is, do you think it's going to crash soon? Did I miss, did I miss the, you know, buying and four digit Bitcoin? What do I do now? <laughs> so you, you can tell like as sentiment starts to shift, like it, it, it happens very quickly. And that's where the, the emotional side of just Bitcoin and volatility and all this stuff um, you can really feel it in the air. And that's what, it's one of the things I like actually, cause I feel like you can feel the sentiment shifting with like by the hour almost oh, 100%. And that's the coolest thing I've ever seen just about a market and a whole new space that's being built. You know, it's really excited when things are moving and even, even when people are super bullish, you know, news stories make them more excited or they hear about a new Bitcoin upgrade and they're excited about it. And, you know, during bear markets, it could be the greatest technological achievement, big changes coming and no one will care because, you know, the price is down and everybody's upset about it. <laughs> so it's uh, it's definitely an emotional space. And that's why I thought just the whole 10K sentiment was good to touch because it's a big psychological barrier, as we said. Um, you know, 20K will be even more interesting as – it makes its way closer to that whenever that does happen. Um, having coming up, 
the coronavirus. It's just all interesting and timely news for sure. I mean, I think a perfect example of a sentiment flip was the uh, at the end of October, October 24th, we dumped, you know, down to 7,500 people were in the dumps. We hung out there for a day and then we went up in the span of it was less than 24 hours. It shows up over two daily candlesticks, but it, the pump started like in the morning and then went through one daily candlestick because the daily candlestick closes, I think, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, at least on this chart I have here. And went up into the next one into the night. We went up from seventy five hundred to ten thousand two hundred, and it was like literally like eighteen hours. It was ridiculous. It was you know a twenty five percent pump, if not more, thirty five, in in the span of and like you remember how quickly the sense of it switched there. Everyone went from being so bearish to bullish because it was like we bled out basically from the June high of fourteen k basically or thirteen nine. And it just it was that constant kind of ranging chop and then bleeding and then boom, you know. And I feel like the past few months has been a nice stair stepping. Um, we made a nice little, I guess you could say, triple bottom here in late November, mid December, late or first week of January, and we've kind of just made a nice stair stepping rally back to 10k here. So it'll be interesting to see if we keep rallying here and like on the higher time frames, it looks really good. Like I'll like. I'm not trying to jinx us, but it, it looks really good right now in high time frame, especially the monthly. Yeah, I mean, every, everybody's excited to kind of get this bear market over with and uh, and feel a little moon action. But moon action. I, I the funny, the, it's the alt, funny part dude, is it's people are like, oh, <laughs> it, it could be, it could it's, be. It, it is. Dude. What, every, a lot of people are dude, waiting for it, for sure. Dogecoin went up like 40%. Like in this month or whatever. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I wouldn't insane. lie about that. <laughs> it was up yeah. for it's up. Okay, it's up 28 percent now, but it was up 40 percent earlier. Mm. Dude, these these low cap oh. these low cap altcoins are just the craziest things in the world. Like their charts are just yeah, I, insanity. I can't imagine people trying to trade them. No, it's it, it's ridiculous. Let's see how Tron's doing because <laughs> Tron's now apparently part of Bitcoin. Have you saw that or whatever? Have you seen that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's yeah, the was, deal with that? That's actually something funny to talk. Pretty much, there's a there's an event called the Satoshi Round Table, Satoshi Round Table that Bruce Fenton holds, and it's just a you know like an offsite event to get people in the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency space together, or just to network and you know stuff like that. So Adam Back from Blockstream and um, Rodolfo Novak from Cold Card Wallet took a picture with Justin Sun, and we're like, you know, Ethereum's done. We're moving Tron over to Bitcoin on the as a token on the Lightning Network. They were just kidding, joking yeah. around, and took the selfie just to trigger people. Oh, but the triggering was real. A crazy reaction. People were super triggered, and yeah. what are they scammers now? And blah blah blah. And it, you know, it was funny. I was like crying. I thought it was great. Uh, it, it people are get a little too serious sometimes, and even Peter McCormack was like making videos with Justin Sun. It was, it was funny. Yeah. It was really funny. I, Some I people just, were not too happy about it, but oh, yeah. it was definitely. It was definitely. I thought it was funny. funny. I, I feel like the Ethereum crowd was not too happy. <laughs> yeah, they're pissed. They're pissed that Tron's going to take their steal their thunder, <laughs> which very well could be the case. Justin, yeah, no, Justin, Justin Sun, Sun is the king of, over here. Yeah, seriously. I mean, really making moves. It's, he would have that Warren Buffett sit down or whatever. I don't know if he actually did it, but no, they did it. I saw a picture with him, Buffett, Charlie Lee. It was, it's. A, I mean, it's a little embarrassing almost, but I mean, I guess that's that's what we're dealing with, and the fact that any of these coins could go into like another alt season and be worth billions of dollars like gets me a little frustrated because you think it's like all right, it's still very immature. Like just from from that sheer fact, you can tell that it's still really early and really immature. Um, but it's fine. People are gonna try to make as much money as they possibly can. If there's a which, price, uh, you, you do what you got to do, right? <laughs> dude, if there's a price and people are bidding or you know bidding and ask, it's gonna it's gonna move. I hate to say it, like perfect example is PG oh, and E, yeah. which is the California. What is it? That you guys utility that yeah, yeah, you know utility. went bankrupt dropped like 90 percent and then rallied like 200 percent. i mean there's no fundamentals there it's just people trading it it's the same thing with shit coins 
sure, yeah. there's money being made there, and it's dangerous because they don't really have any value, but people trade it because of greed, fear, you know, hope. That's why. And then, you know, we think about there's also, we got to remember, I don't know how many people still bag hold. I don't think there can't, there can't be that many left, really. There's still a lot of people bag holding for sure. You, but. <laughs> I'm telling you, there are. There's way more than you think. Yeah, I mean, if you look at it, it's, I mean, it's gotten completely destroyed. But there's people still holding. That's my point. Yeah. A lot of people still holding. I mean, I'm it still you, hasn't even, you can, dude, it was, it was like less than, it was like zero set. I mean, when the, I remember people bought Tron at like nothing sats. <laughs> and like literally, and it went, the, the USD price was insane. Like, I remember hearing about Tron in 20, you know, end of 2017 or whatever. And it was like, it was worth nothing. And and then it just kept going and going. Like it went from like a freaking tenth of a penny or a fifteenth of a penny, so like point zero zero one five to thirty five cents. And it was incredible. Yeah, it's insane. Um, what was the one? What was the one that got Nano Ledger, whatever what it was? What's the one? You remember that? Yeah, like I think Nano. Nano. Nano was yeah. the most insane. Let's see if it's still there. That was. I don't mean to. Oh no, they don't have it. Nano. It was on something else. Um, but anyways, Nano was the most ridiculous thing. I remember looking at the thing and it was like pennies, and then looking at it again and it was like twenty cents, and it was at a few bucks and it was like no big deal, and then it went to thirty bucks, and I was like, and yeah, that that again, yeah. no matter no matter how far it's went, it'll go farther. It's the same thing with stocks. It's the same thing with a lot of things. If you think it's the top, it's gonna keep going. <laughs> Right. It's right. No, that's a really good every point. Every time. Yeah, the markets can get very irrational. And exactly. I, I think people underestimate that as you kind of move into the next cycle bull market. You know, you start. Oh well, the, you know, I've I had a coworker tell me he's like, yeah, I'll probably sell half my position at twenty k, and I was like, <laughs> I didn't want to laugh at him, but I was like. I was like, you're kidding, right? He's like, yeah, you never know. And I'm like, no, nah, I do know. I mean, if you want to take profit at 20K, I can't say anything. But I was like, come on, dude. Shrink it. That's when the party starts. Yeah. You know what I mean? It can. So there's, but there's still a large group of people. He's probably the um, more your average person, whereas you and I are not, right? You're, we're waiting for complete euphoria, the Uber driver telling you, you know, buy this, whatever. And he's like, yeah, I just want to sell at 20K and um, I'll be happy with that. So there's a whole completely different mindset of people out there who are uh, exposed to Bitcoin in whatever way. Everybody's exposed to it so differently, right? Mine's, I'm trying to hold this thing for decades and other people are like, yeah, I just need to make as much money in the next 24 months as possible. And that's okay too. Uh it is interesting. Another good thing, and I've since the more the coin is hated, the more it pumps. Like <laughs> ripples, ripples, actually. ripple is the perfect example. Tron is another example. Like the more a coin is hated, the more it's going to pump. It just happens. Like you know, and no, that's a good heuristic. That's a, that's a good that's a good rule of thumb to keep. Dude, in mind, Tesla's actually. Tesla's the perfect example. Everyone fucking hates Tesla. Everyone knows it's a fraud. And Tesla went from one hundred and eighty bucks to. 950 or 970 it was ridiculous uh it it's it's a perfect example the more people hate it it's just gonna wreck people because people get too attached to it people keep trying to short it you know and you right know. right so oh man yeah if this is if this is the beginning of a crypto bull market then uh god damn it's gonna be it's gonna be a hell of a time I mean, it's possible yeah, considering the liquidity central banks are throwing at the markets and we're just going in every bank, central bank has been easing, literally everyone. Whether you're looking at China, whether you're looking at, you know, ECB, whether you're looking at the Swiss National Bank, whether you're looking at the Fed, it doesn't matter. Every country's central bank is easing. They're cutting rates and they're adding liquidity to markets. And liquidity is going somewhere. It's going to find something to, you know. Right, the spillover could go into this the, the cryptocurrency space. This tiny, space tiny, anyway, tiny, right? tiny it just, space. Because it, it it's, yeah. it's tiny compared to the amount of money, money they're throwing. At, I mean, you know, I think that you know, crypto market cap is like two hundred billion right now, something like that. Maybe a little more than that. But yeah, it's, it's not, not much. It's it's tiny, you know, relative to. Yeah. It's smaller than Apple. <laughs> right. I mean, 
Right. I mean, right, shit. By a lot. Tesla was basically the size of the crypto market cap almost a week ago. Yeah, that's it was insane. close to it. You know, it was so. I think, you know, I think that's a good way to kind of switch subjects here, talking about central bank liquidity and injecting um, QE into the marketplace in various spots. When you think about the coronavirus and even if you assume it's over tomorrow, no more people get infected, everything's all hunky-dory, um, China gets back online producing, no supply chains messed up. You still have a couple of weeks of slowdown there that has an issue and um, you know the Chinese central banks most likely would need to figure out a way to kickstart their economy back, right, and um, pump liquidity into the marketplace. And I think that gets interesting when you think about just global supply chain in general and how much of the global economy is tied into China at such a time when, um, I mean, it's just such a everything. such a huge issue. Like the, every, everything shut down. I know you saw a couple of other articles that you had pulled up with, you know, um, medicine and prescriptions being manufactured in China and all this other stuff. What do you think? You want to get into some of that? Yeah. So here's a perfect example I read from. Uh, this is from Dr. Eric. I'm going to screw it up. Dr. Eric Feigl Ding, and he he just quoted this. I had the article pulled up earlier. It's from Economic Times, IndiaTimes.com. But here's this little comment. Even antibiotics not made in China, like in India, are dependent on China for 90% of ingredients. How long do they have? Most drug makers have one to three months of inventory of drug ingredients, but supplies will dwindle. And I was reading something the other day about like Fiat Chrysler. Like with factories in Europe, they can't produce anything because copper, something deal with copper from China, or somehow China was linked to it, their supply chain, and they can't do anything. And I've read a bunch of other things on Twitter along lines of people who have businesses in China can't do anything right now because nobody can go to work. Um, so they're getting delayed. I have family members that do business with China and they, you know, they were like, they had a trip in March that's canceled. They're not going to China. And I, who would, who would want to go there because it's, right. it's becoming more and more clear day by day that what China, the people, you know, what the communist China, party of China or CCP, the China's communist party, whatever, uh, and Xi Jinping are telling us, and the World Health Organization, which is basically, they're technically politically neutral, but I call bullshit because they're they're not telling the truth. I mean, we went from, you know, oh, everything's, when there was 2,000 cases a few weeks ago, official confirmed cases, they were building two hospitals in Wuhan. And I'm going to say it hospitals in quotation marks because the more I've read about this, but I'll get back to that in a second for a thousand plus patients each. So over 2000 more space for our, and this is Wuhan's a city of 11 million people. It's the size of New York city. They were doing this when there was less than 2000 confirmed cases. And that wasn't making any sense. And then even like a week and a half ago, they, they used like eight venues, like, you know, whether it was stadiums or basketball courts, et cetera, to put more beds in for people. And you're seeing videos of people, all these people in beds in close confined areas. So it means cross infection. Um, but there's videos leaked from these hospitals and, they're like prison cells. They're not. And from what I was reading earlier, this is one Chinese billionaire. And what he was saying, his name is Guo Wang Gi, a.k.a. Miles Kwok. He says basically 12,000 bodies cremated daily, more than 250 million people under quarantine. I saw 400 million this week. China's population is what? One point, is it 1.6 or 1.3 billion? It's, it's close to half. Their, you know, it's, a, it's a lot of people. It's the size of the U.S. population that's under quarantine right now. And it, it, it's under differing um, levels of martial law. Like I think in Wuhan, it's very strict right now. And in certain areas that have the infection, like there's temperature checks every day. I've seen videos of them welding shut apartment doors so people can't leave, which is incredible. Um, and what he was saying was basically 1.5 million confirmed to have coronavirus, which people say, oh, it's a bullshit number. Or that's, But I would agree because none of these numbers we're getting from China it makes sense. And on top of that, Sky News reported earlier today that they built another secret hospital just out of – like China didn't tell anyone they were building – they built another hospital. This one wasn't propagandized like the last time when they were building hospitals. Like they made all these cool videos of them getting to work and building shit. They uh, didn't do any reporting on this one. They built another hospital in Beijing and Beijing only has like 297 confirmed cases or something like that, what I read earlier. 
And then he said more than basically 50,000 deaths today, which would make sense because I saw this crazy um, link and it kind of blew my mind. So uh, Intel Wave or Intel.Wave said data from Windy.com shows massive release of sulfur dioxide gas on the outskirts of Wuhan, commonly associated with the burnings of organic matters. Levels are elevated even compared to the rest of China. Um, I looked at this map and there's nowhere on the fucking planet that has the levels of this. It's not even close. Um, and so when he says organic matter, that means burning either animals or humans. I, I think you know which one it is. Um, and you can see there's pockets of this. So you have it from the same time, the same scale. Notice their emissions are heightened across the board. Only other cities that come close to it is Shang King, which is also afflicted by the coronavirus. So you can see there's more sulfur dioxide. And you can see it now Shanghai and other places on this map if you're watching on YouTube. Um, and he said a couple of distinct possibilities. This is a power plant releasing all this gas? Unlikely, considering how deviant the numbers are from the norm. No, no other city comes close to this much SO2, which is sulfur dioxide, being released from Wuhan. A second one, Wuhan is burning municipal trash and possibly contaminated animal carcasses. Possibly, but why would they not just dump them if they're if where it where they usually do? And third, and most morbid, dead bodies are being burned on the outskirts of the city. The death numbers are way higher than the CCP is letting uh, on about. And things are really, really bad. I don't know uh, the relative probabilities of these events. Make up your own mind at, as to which is most likely. Also note, the scale is displayed that only peaks look at concentrations of 500 uh, something per, I can't even, I don't know, what, the UG grams per meter square meter um and then he basically says if this tweet gets taken down no no it happened yeah the chinese have been taking down tweets because a few weeks ago like when i really started to track this in wuhan there were videos of people literally walking and face planting in the street just videos of people doing it and they were infected so what was the body must have been shutting down they were sick and they obviously hadn't they're either the hospitals at that point obviously were overflowing at that point and this is like mid-january and what would happen is people just face plant and smash their face on the ground and bleed out and die. And I was seeing these videos and that's when I was like, that's when I started to get really worried. And this was like mid January, this was like January 15th or something. Um, and then this guy took something from 4chan or 4 chins. So take this, he says basically take it with a grain of salt, but one post or poster extrapolated the sulfur dioxide released to make uh, data and estimated 14,000 bodies would have had to been burnt for the, to reach this level of, uh, emissions and then you know it just continues on with just the amount of you know so it basically says 17,000 grams per square meters if UG let me see what UG means before it yeah I don't know what that means okay per cubic meter I'm pretty sure it's UG season. so I think okay so microgram so that's microgram UG means microgram that's mm. So, basically, so 17,000 micrograms per square meter, whereas 80 micrograms per square meter is considered dangerously high. So, over <laughs> so over 20x, so 22 times the levels. The next closest, which is um, Chongqing, is 800 uh, micrograms per square meter, and that means that it's 10 times as high. And then here's the global map I saw earlier, and you can see it on my screen. But you can see that the rest of the globe, and it's showing just Eurasia, has nothing. And it's really just China that has the sulfur dioxide release. And you can see the sulfur dioxide also in the northern parts, which I presume is Beijing. Um, and it's all I know is that we are not being told the truth. And I don't. I don't mean to say this here, but I don't really trust my own government with a lot of things, so they've done a lot of shady stuff. If you haven't done your history research, then I'm sorry. I feel bad for you if you believe everything your government tells you. That means you're naive and don't do enough history. Don't read enough history. I do not trust the Chinese at Chinese government. Excuse me, not the Chinese, but the Chinese government. Um, it's already They already lie about a lot of stuff, and it, it, it blows me away that the World Health Organization and even the U.S. administration is congratulating, oh, the Chinese are doing a great job, and it's like, if you look at any of what's going on over there, welding people, stores shut, dragging people out of their apartments, you know, the list goes on. There's a lot of things going on that are really shady. Um, basically, martial law, which I get it because of what's going on, but still, it's getting pretty whack. Um, 
feel free to chime in here. <laughs> no, yeah, I mean, that was uh, <laughs> that was definitely a lengthy overview of the coronavirus. But, I mean, it's all important stuff, right? There's um, – the numbers have been steadily incre- – the official numbers, which – take that for what it is, have been steadily increasing. And I feel like the um, the mortality rate, like the death to infected ratio has stayed like exactly the same every single day as it's moved, as we've, you know, progressed over the weeks. And that's like, that's I, I don't want to cut you off here, right? but Dave, <laughs> no, I don't want to cut you off, but Dave Collin mentioned interesting, he said, we're kind of looking at the wrong way. We shouldn't be looking at the death to infected. We should be looking at the death to who gets better. You know, the people who, um, Recover, death mm-hmm. recovery is the way we should because it takes the two. There's a two week incubation period. That's also the issue with this. People for 14 days. I should explain this. You, the incubation period is 14 days, so someone can catch the virus and travel for 14 days, or go back home, or go wherever, and not show any symptoms, and yet they can still spread it. So people who are asymptomatic can still spread this, which is a huge issue, which means it's really hard to stop. On top of that, it can be transmitted, you know, through. Touch what I've seen, but the biggest problem is it's airborne. So um, breathing in air particles. So someone could be in a room hours before you and breathe air particles, and then you breathe those in and you get infected. And it, from what I'm reading, it goes th- you know through your mouth, through your nose, the mucous membrane, and through your eyes. Um, and like right now, the current official number from BNO News tracking, and this was updated as of oh 9:02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so not too long ago is 40,554 deaths, or excuse me, infected confirmed cases, and 910 fatalities. Um, it's it's getting it's getting worse and worse every day. And like the perfect example is that, that cruise ship that's anchored off, I think it's that Disney cruise ship that's anchored off Japan or whatever. One of them, I don't know if it, I can't remember the name of the cruise ship, but it's anchored off Japan and has over 70 cases now. Originally, they found a few cases and like quarantined the ship and had it like anchored off Tokyo, whatever and they were like yeah we're not letting off the ship and the cases have just been rising and rising and rising and i don't mean to laugh about it but like yesterday when i was looking at the cases number one was china mainland china number two was the cruise ship and number three is singapore so the cruise ship comes in second place (laughs) it sounds terrible but that's yeah (sighs) yeah it's an it's insane uh the cruise ship thing was very interesting i saw uh, Bitcoiners who are in the New Jersey area were very upset about the cruise ship that was, um, I think, quarantined for a very short period of time uh, in Bayonne. I guess it, like uh, Cape Liberty. I think I've taken a cruise out of there actually. Um, and there were there were infected on the ship, and then they just let the other two thousand people out. <laughs> and people were like, you know, what the fuck? Maybe you should, you know, keep those everybody on the ship under quarantine for a little bit longer, <laughs> and. It's really hard, right? Like if I'm on the ship and I think I'm not infected and I know other people are on the infected, infected, I'm like, you know, get me off, off this fucking ship, right? And on the other hand, if you're not on the ship, you're like, nah, why don't you stay on that ship and not get off? Because how do I know whether or not you're infected? And then you go out and 14 days later, you've infected however many other people. It's really, really um it's mind boggling to think about that because everybody's in this different situation, right? Um, you could be really strict about it and just be like, no more flying period from anywhere to anywhere. Like how, how, how do you know how bad it gets until it's almost too late? And that's where this kind of stuff, when you, if it's going to happen or not is irrelevant. I think when you just think about it from a global macro perspective and the repercussions of even just a few weeks of a slowdown in one region of the world that is, you know, the you know like the rock that holds the global economy together outside of the um, the U.S. banking system and Federal Reserve. I mean that's where all of the manufacturing's happening, um, all this stuff. And I think to kind of bring it back and think decentralization, I think a lot of countries and a lot of businesses are going to take a big step back here and think how do we decentralize our supply chain so that we're not leaning and specifically dependent upon China for goods, services, raw materials, whatever. You, everybody's going to think twice about this now. And I think that has tremendous implications. Yeah. No, the, the, I was really pissed about the New Jersey Royal Caribbean cruise thing because they had four suspected cases. They took those people off the ship, took them to the hospital, whatever. And this, this cruise ship, it boarded like in northern New Jersey, rather than New York, outside Newark and right outside New York City. 
And then they're like, oh, the, this mayor tweeted. I don't know who the mayor was of what city. He tweeted, oh, you know, the risk is low-level risk, you know, and we're just going to let all these people go. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, have you not seen what they did in Hong Kong where they had a ship? They waited 14 days in Japan where they are, still have a ship quarantined and people are just getting more and more infected. If it turns out those four people, even if just one has the infection, um, that's a very big issue because that means it's likely spread and other people got off the boat because of the way the cruise ship is confined and all, you know, how the um, air system works in there. It's likely that if that's the case, then we're going to have a very bad issue in that uh, New York, New York, New Jersey area shortly in the coming month. Again, the problem is, is it takes 14 days and people who are asymptomatic can spread it. So, it, you know, and another thing on top of this, which is really scary, is that this virus can stay on. Now it's the official number I've seen is nine days at room temperature can stay on surfaces. Um, so I would be careful buying stuff from China right now because considering the way things get shipped, especially if they get shipped in a container on a ship, like one of those um, typical cargo metal containers you think of, those are perfect. It's going to be humid in there. It's going to be perfect temperature. And they're just going to sit in a ship and they're going to be across the ocean in warm weather. So the virus will probably thrive in that condition. Uh, and it's a dark, humid environment, excuse me, which is even worse. Like they, they said, like literally, they said that like in order to make packages safe, safe to ship out from China, like all these manufacturing places and whatever, they should set packages outside. So now the world's largest manufacturer has to become the world's largest warehouse, as they were saying which, you know, they don't have the capacity to do. So what are they going to do? You know, you don't expect the Chinese to set these boxes out in the open in the sun for four days, five days, you know, to eradicate the virus. Uh, it's it's quite mind-boggling. And, you know, this already is really messing up the global supply chain. And we're seeing it kind of across the board. Oil, um, oil prices have reflected this. Yeah, here's the oil chart. Oil has just been tanking since basically the beginning of January. Gold, or excuse me, copper has also been tanking for the past three weeks since the middle of January. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the question is, is, you know, since we're so dependent on China, the world, you know, for all types of supplies, and even if it isn't produced there, the supplies come out of there, you know, and you don't even think about it, but everything, you know, auto manufacturers they get their stuff made over like when i did an internship working for you know auto um basically uh tier one tier two tier three auto sales everything is connected to china at some point you know whether it's aluminum you know certain steel etc because it's just cheaper to make it there it is uh and you you realize how serious this is this can get in the next few months um and even though xi jinping wants to everyone to go back to work today really because it's we're recording on a sunday night in america time so it is their work day right now that's only going to exacerbate this problem and i can tell you for a fact the numbers are wrong they're low that's what i mean they're low uh there's no way around it they can't test people fast enough they don't have enough test kits on top of that another scary fact is all our medical equipment in america is made in two countries china and taiwan um if you don't see the glaring issue there, then I don't, I don't know how to help you. But it's a really big issue for us. Um, and I think a lot, a lot of companies and corporations and people are going to, after this, whether this blows over in a month or if it doesn't blow over, which I think is likely the case at this point because it doesn't seem like it's just going to blow over. I think this is going to take a while to run its course. Um, a lot of people are going to re rethink global supply chains and you know who to rely on. And don't put all your eggs in one basket because just because it's super, super efficient and it's the most cost effective thing. I was reading a tweet earlier. It's like, you know, the most max, you know, the maximum efficient system is also super fragile. Right. Right. And that right. Because it's almost super efficient. No, there's little room for error. Um, and, and this is one of those circumstances where a potentially huge error can um, lead to some interesting consequences. I was thinking about the global supply chain and just the types of businesses that China's in. And I thought, what's a Bitcoin related industry that China's in? And that's mining. I haven't noticed any decrease in the hash rate yet um, because of this. And I, I don't know if 
if these mines aren't necessarily big enough to be impacted or maybe they're in certain locations in China where they wouldn't be impacted where people can be working there full time and there's not really any slowdown. Uh, it'll be interesting to see in hindsight if there is a dip in the hash rate anywhere. But the way I'm thinking about it now, um, if anything, hash rate spreading out, there's more and more people looking to uh, start mining industries in North America and they still have access to cheap renewable energy. And people are bullish, so they're adding more hash rate to the network. So um, only hindsight will tell us if we see any hash rate in particular drop off here. But um, the supply chain things are so big because it, it exposes these um, where you could be over leveraged in certain areas. And it doesn't come out until really black swanish. Um, far away on the tail type events happen where it's like, oh, a, a potential pandemic issue in a country that slows down global trade. There's period. And you, you know, you learn from those mistakes and it's so early still, right? Just as you said, this, you, it, you might not know anything about the full story until May of this year. Like, you don't know. It, it can take a long time for this stuff to play out. And it doesn't look like the, um, it's like a, vertical line s curve hockey stick chart on the number of infected per day just keeps going up and up and up so you know as soon as that starts slowing down sure maybe you can start to ballpark how much worse it can get but it's impossible to say as you said there's not enough testing material there's not enough resources to actually perform all the testing to get accurate figures how do you really know and you made a good point you know don't trust verify with this kind of stuff it's better to be on the safe side. I had to fly like last week and I was pissed and I brought my N95 mask. <laughs> like it sucks. Like nobody wants to travel right now. And that's, yeah, that's I the need kind to, of sentiment that even, even, even that I need to buy an N95. Sentiment, people. Yeah. 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 Definitely get one. Um, you know, even just that of people are going to think twice about trips, not even just to China, but anywhere people don't want to go to the airport. They don't want to be anywhere super densely popular. I don't even want to go into the city to go into work. Like I'm dreading going in tomorrow because I think as the weeks progress, I'm going to see more and more people wearing masks because it's getting worse. And then I'm going to be like, all right, well, I'm just going to work from home until this thing blows over. Cause there's no sense in me going into the office, into a city with millions and millions of people in there when you can get it from just breathing the air. It, it sounds extreme, but like those are more worst case scenarios that even the, just the fact that a very small percentage of the population is thinking that and they actually act on it, it, it does have a ripple effect into the economy. Yeah. No, I was going to say I had to go to a doctor because my ear, I think I messed it up just going too deep in a pool and sitting at the bottom of a pool a week ago and I had to go to urgent care and it might have looked ridiculous, but I wore, you know, some shooting glasses I have that nice wrap around, you know, check particles from getting your eye. I wore a face mask and gloves. I was like, I was like, I don't care, because at this at this point, <laughs> I full, uh, oh foil no, hat. at this point, oh dude, I went full fucking tinfoil hat. I don't care what people think. I was like, uh, I was like, I'm, I was because at this point, I had read about you know it being airborne, and it's like, great, who knows if someone had walked in here sick because I'm in an area where people vacation, and I'm like, who knows if someone came in here who was sick or there's already. Thankfully, when I went in, there really wasn't anyone in the urgent care, but I was like, if someone was in here 30 minutes before me and was sick, I don't know. I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> And like I, I need. Yeah. There's an Ace Hardware near me. I need to go buy some N95 mask. I have. A, I but I bought a boatload of fucking surgical mask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I'm yeah. not taking any chances. Go find an N95 if you can. Yeah, it's no, definitely it's like, worth it. And exactly. If people can give me shit about it, people can give me shit. I already bought water and enough food and supplies for the person I'm living with right now, for like a month. Fine, laugh at me now. But like, guess what? In like by the end of February. I don't think anyone's going to be laughing it, and it could be, it might not be till early March, but again, as I said, the, the 14 day incubation period is what really, really makes this tough. Right. Um, and then no, I agree. With you. I agree. And then you got to think like, okay, so say it doesn't get here right away. Countries that have weak healthcare systems, like Africa is notable. Like most of Africa has a weak healthcare system. There's people like, oh, why aren't they reporting Africa? And I like was tw someone was putting a tw tweet about it. And I was like, you want to know why? Because they have a weak healthcare system. And also, okay, great, someone shows up with a fever or shows up with pneumonia, and they don't they don't address it properly. You know, and right. 
the one I was reading was like usually the first 10 days the patient's fine and then they get whatever a fever or some other kind of symptoms and they're sick but it's the third week when it gets really bad so it takes a while for someone to get really sick and the third week of my reading was either you die or you make it and another problem with this is it's not like you get it once and then you're clean and you're clear and okay you've been sick once you can't get infected again you can get reinfected with this so it's 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 pretty scary and People may think I'm overblowing this. People may think I'm crazy and I'm just, you know, super whatever. I don't even know the correct term. Not bearish because it's more like I'm being paranoid or overblowing this. But, like, if you really look into this, like, as I said, like, when I was seeing people faceplant in Wuhan, that's when I was like, okay, time to go buy water. And that, sure, I bought water early, (laughs) but I have fucking water. (laughs) Like, no. I was like, I'm not waiting any longer, like, uh, you know, because no, there's... S- Singapore, they ran out of supplies, dude. There's like, I don't know, uh, let me check the official cases in Singapore, but like Lockheed Martin and a bunch of other, they have their 70th air, annual air show there in Singapore coming up this next week or so. Uh, and a bunch of people like Lockheed Martin and a couple others pulled out of the air show because of the coronavirus there. Singapore is now 43 official cases, six critical, six recovery. You saw the Singapore, it, there were lines I saw. I don't know if you saw the videos of people, you know, outside of places trying to buy supplies. And that's how it happens. It doesn't happen like gradually. It's going to be one day you wake up and everyone's panicking. And a lot of people don't realize like all these grocery stores you go to, they have usually a few days of supplies at most. So if the trucking industry in the U.S. stops, good fucking luck getting food. That's all I have to say. Three days and you're screwed. Like literally. It'll be that quick. And if, if everyone went in and bought a week's worth of food or supplies or let's say everyone – no, not a week. Let's say everyone went in and bought in three weeks of supplies, grocery store shelves will be empty. And people don't believe me. Go watch the movie Contagion. I know it's a movie, but just go watch it, please. Because it's kind of unfolding how this is unfolding. you know. And, and I, I've reiterated this line a bunch, but Brian Cranston in the movie plays some military you know, general. Um, and he basically says before they were doing martial law in the U.S., He's like, no one can know until everyone knows. And that's that's kind of where I feel right now, you know, a lot of – because there's definitely people like officials, you know, up high in government branches or organizations that know what's really going on, that have real details. But they're not saying it because they don't want to panic and they don't want – you know, as I said, no one can know until everyone knows. And, the, you know, and so no, that's that's my thoughts. No, I mean, I think those are good thoughts. And for some things, it's maybe better to be a little bit more paranoid than not. Um, This is one of those instances where I will even try to be more paranoid than I probably usually am anyway about this kind of stuff. Typically, this kind of thing wouldn't matter to me. But because of the circumstances, I think it's worth being extra careful. And it's fine. And you know, I guess selfishly, it also fits my kind of global macro narrative of things that I'm looking for to play out. Like what a coincidence, you know, coronavirus as markets are hitting all time highs, Bitcoin's breaking out, um, you know, commodities are moving. There's more uh, negative yielding debt than in human history. Central banks are pumping like it was just the one more thing to throw on that's like just totally fits my global macro is really wacky narrative bullish on bitcoin you know what i mean it's just of course it fits I, of course it's going to be something i'm interested in but um i guess we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now it's starting to play out a little bit more each time we cover it i'm sure we'll talk about it again uh next week as more information comes out and it, until then it's you just do what you can right yeah. Here, and another thing, so that I, I, I posted this on my Insta story earlier today. It was like passenger transport volumes in China during the Lunar New Year holiday year over year percentage wise um, from 2019 to or 28, I guess 28, well, 2019 to 2020, because I forgot their Lunar New Year's and then uh, New Year. It fell like, depending on what you look at, like for instance, I think air travel fell 60, looks like road travel fell 75 to 80%, 75%. Railway fell seventy percent. I mean, it's wow. I mean, and and you're seeing these videos of cities, like people forget China's a fucking massive country, and there's so many people there. Wuhan's yeah, eleven. Huge. I didn't even like. I didn't realize how big Wuhan. Eleven million people. It's the size of New York City, and all these other cities that have millions of people are empty. 
No one's going out. No one's doing anything. No one's buying anything. You know, to, to think this won't hit the global economy is just not, you're being naive. And right. I know the equity markets haven't reflected it yet. They did. There's a little scare last week, but I we really haven't priced this in. And and I'm worried that – like Jeff Bezos sold $4 billion of his shares last week. Come on. Like why is he selling $4 billion now? Like he, he knows. You know? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, he could – he could know for sure. There was, oh. a, I think, there was a somebody. Somebody had posted a chart about insider buying, and you know, there was there was a decent amount. But at the same time, you know, I don't know. Does it always look like that? in, in this quarter and first quarter of, you know, the year, I, I have no idea. I haven't gone back to actually check to see if it's comparable. Um, and even somebody said the thing about Bezos. They're like, yeah, well, he always sells, you know, a certain amount at a particular time interval. It's like, okay, well. You know, of course, it's coincidental and it fits my narrative. Of course, he's dumping because he knows. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of insiders took took some off the table. And on one hand, it's like, could you look at that and say, oh well, you know, they're bearish on coronavirus or other global macro, or are they thinking to themselves, hmm, all of these, you know, major equities are trading at, you know, multiples that they've never traded at before, super extended, and you know. You're paying a lot for value companies. Maybe they take some off the top, and that's a completely rational thing to do. Yeah, I'm trying to find the data, but all I can get is the buy data, not the sell data. Did we touch on the Baltic Dry Index too? I don't know if we have yet. No, but you should yeah. bring it up. Okay, so the Baltic Dry Index it tracks um, the freight rates for which the world's largest cargo ships, um, basically, you know, the price of it. Um, they, and I did the percentage number because it just to show. So the peak in September fourth, twenty nineteen, it has fallen eighty percent from there. And that's the span of what I guess close to six months now. Um, and on a number scale, it's fell from twenty four hundred to four four fifteen. That's a pretty hefty fall. Uh, granted, in two thousand eight, it fell from eleven thousand three ninety to nothing <laughs> it fell to right. a, you know it fell to a thousand so it fell a, a lot then um percentage wise i you know, i'll try to i'll try to make it out here and that might have been because oil prices were really high at that time too yeah no that would definitely make sense dude i i'm so lucky yeah, i'm so lucky like i wasn't driving then dude point. yeah i'm so lucky i didn't have a driver's license then holy shit when gas was just retarded <laughs> I mean, Gas was five dollars a gallon in in the East Coast in yeah. two thousand eight money. Oh, it was ridiculous. You know, I mean, it was it was a it was really high. So that might be why it looks so skewed to the upside on the yeah. Baltic Dry Index. But yeah, it um, fell ninety two percent from May yeah. of oh eight to November. I mean, that's incredible. Well, what do you think? That's probably a good way to wrap it up. We covered yeah. you know Bitcoin ten k coronavirus update. Um, all good, just macro shit that is going on right now. And I think there's, uh, you know, right, stay tuned. There's always going to be more to come, especially with this kind of stuff. As it unfolds, you really never know what it's going to look like, how how bad it can get or how overblown it could be in hindsight, um, playing devil's advocate, although I don't necessarily think it would end up being not as bad as we think it is Uh you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty with this stuff, but you know, that's just that just is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think I think by the end of February we'll have a better outlook, and if this has gotten better or worse. And yeah. granted, you know, granted again, you know, it might not come here first; it might spread to other, you know, other parts, you know, the world, continent-wise. It could go to Africa and then venture its way to South America, and then you know, come through Central into America. So uh, I don't know how this will turn out, but it's all I know is it's. It's going to get interesting here shortly. There's no way around it. Yep. Uh, yeah, this was this was episode 70 of the Beef and Bitcoin podcast. Well, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave us a comment. Uh, send us a DM. Let us know what you want us to talk about. Also, if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that definitely helps with, uh, you know, move this up the charts. I uh, really do appreciate that. And as always, you know, congrats on 10K. Maybe it'll, we'll wake up and it'll be... 9k tomorrow you never know but um yeah stay safe out there and stack sets stack water bottles
Peace. <laughs>